it's great to have you here at our inaugural um, AI Education Symposium here at Western University, hosted in our Faculty of Education. Um, just wanted to do a few different things before we get things um, underway, and get underway we shall. Um, so first, I want to take the time to acknowledge that Western University is located on the traditional territories of the Ashinaabek, um, Haudenosaunee, um, Lenapewak, and Chonongduk. Nations on lands connected with the London Township and Sombra Treaties of 1796 and the Dish with One Spoon Covenant Wampum. Um, this land continues to be home to diverse Indigenous people who we recognize as contemporary stewards of the land and vital contributors to our society. Um, second, um, I also want to take the opportunity to thank um, our funders and backers behind this, namely Western University, who helped make the project that this falls under possible, and also SHIRC, which is the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada, um, very gracious in their support of this endeavor as well. Um, lastly, I've got a group of people here that have helped um, get this project underway and help organize things. Um, in particular, um, I want to call attention to one individual, um, George Gadonitis, who um, has been kind of the core behind organizing this particular event, would not have been possible without him. Um, he's going to try and hook me off the stage if I say too much, and he wouldn't say anything himself, but he's been very great working behind the scenes, getting the speakers organized, the food that we're enjoying, the space, basically everything. So thank you, George, for making all of this possible for the rest of us. Um, so now I think it's time to get the show under road. So I'm going to start by inviting Donna Katsopoulos, um, who's the Dean of the Faculty of Education, to come forward and help introduce our first keynote. So, Donna, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. As uh, you heard from Mike, my name is Donna Katsopoulos, and I'm very proud to serve as the faculty at Dean of the Faculty of Education. And I'm delighted to welcome you to our faculty and to the AI Education Symposium, whether you're joining in person or online. I'm so grateful that you're here with us. There's people from across Canada, there's a people from across Ontario and across sectors, high, from universities to schools to colleges, and we welcome all of you to this important conference. Um, this is one of the first events of its kind at Western, and it couldn't come at a better time. I'm sure that I don't have to tell this crowd twice the growing, pre pre the growing presence of artificial intelligence in our lives, as well as the increasing impact it's having in our society. Whatever the impact may be, we can rest assured knowing that there are research teams, educators, such as the ones that have put together today at this event, who are working to ensure the benefits of AI will serve our children, our youth, our schools, and our communities. This symposium stems from the leading AI education project, which is funded by Western University and the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council. And it's an outreach project that offers freely accessible AI resources for educators as well as the general public. What makes me so excited, one of the things that makes me excited about this project is that it centers around a true passion of mine, uh, open educational resources and OERs for short. As educators, researchers, and leaders, I believe we have an obligation to provide free resources where possible. And we've seen firsthand how OERs can help tear down the financial barriers students have. And earlier this year, I'm really proud to announce that the Faculty of Education launched OpenEDU, which is our virtual hub for all the educational resources that, it, that have been developed by our faculty researchers and community partners. We have so many resources available to teaching, inclusive education, youth mental health, preventing sexual violence, and of course, AI education. So I would encourage you to visit this uh, resource. I also wanted to share my gratitude and praise for the research team. Associate Professor Mike Ketchabaugh, who you just heard from, our Professor George Gadnidis, Jody Williams, who does great work in Dufferin Peel Catholic District School Board, First Nations Métis and Inuit Education Association of Ontario. She's been a long time partner and it was so exciting to see her today. And our professor and associate dean of graduate education who you'll hear from shortly, Immaculate Namakasava. 
Uh, these four are supported by a team of talented PhD candidates, in, which includes Matthias Paul Babin, Jonathan Tan from the Department of Computer Science, as well as our faculty's own PhD candidates, Mara Bartrand, Lisa Ann Floyd, and Billy. Thank you to everyone. Before I hand it over to our first um, keynote speaker, our associate dean had a fun, immaculate, had a fun uh, idea for writing the introduction. So in keeping today's theme, we tried to do, use chat GPT to help do an introduction with a distinguished tone for our speaker, as if it's being delivered by a university dean. So here it is, and then I'll add my own personal comments at the end. So this is chat GPT speaking. Distinguished guests, esteemed colleagues, it is with great honor and reverence that I introduce you to Professor Sheila uh, Jasanoff, uh, the eminent Forsheimer Professor of Science and Technology Studies at Harvard Kennedy School. Uh, Professor Janoff's name has, stands out as a beacon of intellectual prowess and scholarly distinction with an incredible output comp compromising of comprising of over 130 articles and chapters and alongside authorship or edit editorship of more than 15 seminal volumes, including the esteemed works such as The Fifth Branch and The Designs on Nature. And she's etched her leg legacy in, pro in preeminent authority in the realm of science, technology, and society. At the heart of her scholarly inquiry lies an unwavering dedication to unraveling the intricate tapestry of science technology nexus with law, politics, policy of the modern democracies. Through her unparalleled insights, she has illuminated the path forward, shedding light on the profound implications of technology advancements on the fabric of our society. So as we convene today to embark on this journey, in AI education, there is perhaps no better individual to guide us in our thinking. I will add, that was ChatGPT, I mean, you've got to admit it did pretty well, but I just wanted to add, I had an opportunity to spend the evening yesterday with Sheila, and we spent a lot of time talking in the car, and it's one of those rare moments that you think, gee, I wish I had taken a class with this person, like how do I get to be in front of this person as a learner? And so today's an incredible opportunity to do that. It is such an honor to have you here with us and to be able to hear your thoughts on this topic from a very personal perspective. I am deeply grateful that you would make this journey to join us. It's been a privilege the last 24 hours and, and I hope that there's a continuance. She's invited me to Harvard and I'm going, I'm definitely going. So please join me in extending a resounding welcome to Professor che Sheila Jasanoff, whose presence amongst us uh, enriches us in this academic setting, but particularly in this topic and as individuals. So thank you very much. Donna, the thing about the chat GPT thing is that really you could say that about any person in this room because it's just a form of words strung together. And I think that what's missing in these introductions is the other half of the communicative uh, dyad that's always present when somebody speaks to somebody else, the listener as well as the person doing the talking. Um, you know, no better person to illuminate the path forward, but illuminate for whom and why is somebody even seeking illumination from you at all? And I'm deeply grateful to the organizers and inviters of this group and the team behind them that they have left plenty of time for discussion afterwards. And I think that that's, you know, really where the where the contribution comes into focus and you know you were um, all coming from the field of education or contiguous to the field of education and I think even though the etymology is something about leading people out it's uh, really much more important to think about the people and why anybody is needing to be led from anywhere to anywhere and you know, coming as I do from the U.S. with the news of the last 24 hours sort of circulating in the wider uh, digital sphere, 
the question whether the leaders we currently have are the right leaders for the people is, you know, maybe even more uppermost in my mind. So how do the people lead their leaders is, in a way, a subtext for this first opening talk in the symposium, which was um, on the broad subject of AI and democracy, so not AI and education per se. Um, so a very specific thanks to George, who nabbed me almost a year ago now to um, ask me to um, play a part in this symposium and also to Immaculate for being willing to uh, respond without troubling me to send notes, slides, and various other things in advance. I have to say I've really appreciated that courtesy. And Mike and Donna, your hospitality and your back, um, your backup um, in all kinds of ways, Mike, for guiding me around your incredibly beautiful campus today. That's been a really extraordinary gesture of welcome. But then when I come to Canada, I always experience welcome in a way that I'm not sure we know how to reciprocate south of the border. But if you come to visit Cambridge, I will reciprocate. <laughs> and with that as introductions, let me move on to the topic of today's talk. Well, so. Many people like to point to specific moments in time for when a topic comes into focus, and very often a moment they pick is 1996. Of all places in Davos, Switzerland, better known for the World Economic Forum, but it was also the location where John Perry Barlow, former lyricist of the Grateful Dead and recently deceased, uh, declared a manifesto on cyber independence. And the rhetoric was very inflated. It reads in a kind of uh, 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 passionate, um, um, you know, rhetorical way that, uh, you know, sort of invites people to believe. So governments of the industrial world, you weary giants of flesh and steel. Uh, on behalf of the future, I ask you of the past to leave us alone. But the sentence that particularly grabs me, because my training is in law originally, and hence in political theory and politics, is you have no sovereignty where we gather. So you are not the rulers, you governments of flesh and steel, whoever those are. The sovereignty, the sovereign space is being reclaimed on behalf of somebody else. And ideally, that somebody else is anybody who walks into this nearly liberated sphere, the digital sphere, where the rules and regulations and constraints and bonds of that old material world will no longer apply. So that was the promise. It was a promise of progress, but a promise of human progress, not just of technological progress, that this technology would make us free, free to be ourselves in ways that had not been imagined. And if you go back to the writings of many of my colleagues in political science and in public policy from about the turn of the century, everybody imagined that cyberspace would be a space where people could express themselves as members of a DEMOS in ways they ha had not been able to express themselves before, because everybody would have this portal at their fingertips and they would be able to write and say and think whatever they wanted. What people didn't ask is, OK, great, here is a doorway. It opens into a space. But what's on the other side? So what is the future that people want to lead to? I mean, is it the case that having open access to a space of self-expression in itself makes a democracy. It's striking to historians and theorists of democracy that 2,000 plus years of thinking about what makes a good democracy didn't figure. People mistook access and voice for everything to do with the formation of publics and what kind of rule would ensue if you gave everybody a chance to simply express themselves. So I've put there a sort of history of bridges of different sorts, and you may recognize Sydney and Brooklyn if you're aficionados of bridges. But if you're bridging from one place to another, if it's a temporal era from the present to the future, what is this future that we're 
aspiring toward. And I think education as a word has that same philosophical conundrum built into it. It, you know, etymologically focuses on the being led out of, but being led into what is in a way the more important of these questions. So I didn't use ChatGPT, but I did run a little search of one of my newspapers of choice, the New York Times, and I plugged in AI and democracy to see what headlines had appeared in the last year. And you see, they're not optimistic headlines. So see how easily AI chatbots can be taught to spew disinformation, how AI tools could change India's election where a result is expected. It's the most known of expected results. But on June 4th, after you know, six weeks or seven weeks of polling across this giant country. AI wrote a housing bill. Critics say it's not intelligent. So in artificial intelligence writes a bill that's not intelligent. So obviously there is some ironicizing going on there. And artificial intelligence and democracy, are they compatible? Uh, it's interesting that a widely recognized to be failed politician of the UK, Nick Clegg, has become the spokesperson for Meta and talks about its international affairs. So you can read the article for yourself and conclude whatever you want to conclude. But overall, the tenor of these headlines is not triumphalist. It's not John Perry Barlow. It's some other kind of thing. And this from... Uh, uh, July of last year, about a year ago, op-ed piece by colleagues of mine from MIT, Darren Asimoglu is a very eminent economist. Um, I don't think he would easily, as easily find a place at Harvard, but MIT is brave enough to accommodate him. But, but look at what he and his colleagues say. We believe the AI revolution could even usher in the dark prophecies envisioned by Karl Marx over a century ago. Then in the op-ed they say why Marx, in the classic version of Marx, was wrong, but the circumstances that Marx foresaw are closer to being the circumstances in which AI is being developed today. So Marx was convinced that capitalism naturally led to monopoly ownership, and then they say why that assumption was wrong at the time, and that oligarchs would use their economic clout to run the political system and keep workers poor. So their thesis in this article is that we are much closer today to imagining capitalism in that very tightly constrained form, oligarchy, that Marx foresaw. It wasn't right at his time because it turned out that the material technologies of the mid-19th century were smaller, more flexible, allowed for more competition, and so on, than the digital platform technologies of our time that are more concentrated and come closer to being oligarchies. So these are not my pessimistic understandings. They're understandings that are shared widely among the engineers and developers, among even economists, and among some cross-section of policymakers and policy thinkers as well. So one can step back and say, you know, if instead of looking at how rapidly the technology is developing and how many millions and billions of dollars are being invested, I mean, the sort of standard measures of the gee whiz sort that you hear at the beginning of any AI talk is look how quickly it came on board and look how many millions of people signed up on day one and look how many billions have been invested and, you know, look how many industries it's already revolutionizing and so, I mean, so it's all on the productionist end. But if you look the other way at what is the future that we want, whose rulership and what forms of governance do we care about, and what are the problems in any case that we want to see being governed, a very different picture emerges. So the question of who rules was already there in the asthma glue quote, quote that I gave you. The expertise is concentrated in relatively few hands. I mean, it's still the biggest companies are in Silicon Valley, and you know it may be a highly international workforce by now, but you know in the discussion we can talk about what even the internationalization of the Silicon Valley workforce means in terms of a global 
economy. The capital is extremely concentrated. Any measures that look at the top level income inequality in the US show that income inequality is both rising and becoming more concentrated in fewer hands. Um, Oxfam does this measure every January before the Davos meetings of um, the wealthiest individuals in the world. And what's not put beside it is that similar numbers apply to the US itself, that there are three or four or five people or families sometimes that own the wealth of half of the rest of the population. So this is concentration in a way that Karl Marx you know, could only have dreamed about. And then, of course, there's the lack of transparency feature. Uh, so I had an interesting discussion with Mike this morning in which he was saying that even to do research on his area of computer science development, you have to work closely with the companies that are doing the applications because the data are closely held and not shared unless presumably if you're working with them, you're under non-disclosure agreements and you operate de facto as part of the company. So, you know, certain kinds of problems are very hard to even measure statistically or come to recognize in a quantifiable sense that can be compared or tracked over a period of years and so on. Nevertheless, we know that there are behavioral impacts. I once, probably the only time in my life, had the opportunity to sit at a dinner with Eric Schmidt to my right and a number of the moguls of that industry, including um, um, you know, Sam Altman was two people down at the table. I mean, this is several years before uh, ChatGPT. And they were talking about how they uh, don't allow their children to spend time on, on uh, computers and doing video games and so forth. So they were very aware of bullying and teen suicidality and so on. And the Attorney General of the US has released a report talking about the epidemic of loneliness. It's not my phrase, it's a phrase that's coming out of the medical domain. And just recently I saw that diagnoses of PTSD have jumped from something in the 3% range to the 7% range just over the last year among um, young adults. Um, and these are not I mean, they're showing symptoms of PTSD, but not with any of the classic triggers like they have been exposed to violent crimes or whatever. So somehow the symptomatology is there, even though the triggering events, the traumas that the psych psychiatry community recognizes are not the same trigger. So what, what is triggering the fact that an increasingly high percentage of young adults are feeling these symptoms that are they're, they're pathological. I mean, they're classified as a disorder. And so who are the people being governed? I mean, in theory, it's we the people, but we know that these are incredibly surveilled societies now, that there are forms of addiction that involve social media, and that conspiracy theory is another of these things that's on the rise. So, you know, the sort of we will be free, we will be liberated, we will be able to express ourselves, we will have true democracies, sovereigns will be overthrown and we will take back sovereignty. That seems to be a, a promise that's not exactly being kept. I mentioned before that my training is law, so I tend to stand back and say, well, there are if the question is about governance, surely there are constitutional level issues swirling below the surface, and can we identify those? If we want to make an analytic starting point, that's not all about how many new millions of users of ChatGPT are on the table, but what should we care as members of constitutionally governed societies? The things that I, as a scholar of science and technology studies, focus in on are where do science and technology enter in to create novel forms of life that we don't know what to do with? Ways of being together, but even ways of being. And because a lot of my work began with the biological sciences and is moving over to the information sciences and technologies, I do put the two of these technologies together in thinking analytically. 
So we've known for a long time that the biological sciences have thrown up quite challenging questions about what humanness is because we've tinkered technologically with the beginnings and endings of life. And where does the human end and the non-human begin and vice versa? This was being thought about in the biological sciences around the same time, but in different ways, from thinking about the human-machine interface and where does the one end and the other begin. Um, I have a term, ontological surgery, that I use to refer to the fact that when you have these novel entities, you have to sort of carve them out of society, define them, and give them status in some way. So philosophers, moral philosophers, love the question, does X belong in my moral community? For instance, does a great ape have the same rights to existence and respect as a human being does? And you know, in the high-tech worlds, there are these entities like what is the status of an IVF embryo, an embryo created outside the mother's body um, or outside any person's body. And similarly, what is a data subject, the kind of crystallization of your informational self, you know, what is its status? These are moments of ontological surgery in the sense that out of the morass of stuff, you have to identify this thing that you deem worthy of protection and worthy of constitutional recognition in some ways. And then a constitutionalist way of thinking can come into play and you can think about, does this thing have rights? Does it have dignity? Is it property? Is it entitled to have property? And so on and so forth. I have to say that I was rather struck at Justice Alito's explanation for why flag number two could be flown at their beach residence. And he said, that house is in his wife's name, and she has sole title to the property. Therefore, she, as a private citizen of the United States, is entitled to express her freedom of speech. And this is not the upside down flag. It's the other January 6th flag. But what struck me was that property rights were in a way transcending the ethic of anything else in the public sphere. That is, her right to express herself in any way she pleased was being tied to her ownership of property and not to anything relational of the sort that we might think of, like you are married to a Supreme Court justice and at least in tra traditionalist views of marriage like Justice Alito buys into, man and wife are con kind of considered the same entity, I mean, in his own religious thinking and so on. So, you know, but that was, you know, so where do Americans reach for justification is a kind of interesting question and it has constitutional dimensions to it. All right, so another thing that somebody in my field thinks about is, origin stories. I mean, are these absolutely new things? It's very conventional for people at the forefront of technology to think that the world they see is utterly new. John Perry Barlow certainly saw cyberspace as a completely new domain. But is it new or has it been percolating so that the questions have arisen elsewhere? And I would say that under these four different headings, these are not new questions in and of themselves. And we have some, at least, imagined answers that people have been thinking about. So playing God at the frontiers of technology, are you intervening in domains that, for whatever spiritual, religious, moral reasons, you should not be playing with? That you should take certain things as foundational and not to be disrupted. Then, obviously, the question of state surveillance has been with us for a very long time. Loss of control, but by loss of control, I mean loss of autonomy. I mean, so the human beings own autonomous position. And then intelligence. What is this thing that machine intelligence is? And you know, anybody who uses generative AI these days is told it's a statistical instrument. It simply collects the next word by the likelihood that it's it is the next word that out of a huge database would have been chosen. This is why you know, you can feed in a certain text and it doesn't matter who the subject is. There's a kind of sameness sound to the text that is going to be generated. And, and you, know, you can sort of sense a chat GPT generated text when you're reading it from the nature of the syntax and the, the somehow the flatness of the expression that, that 
emerges out of it. All right, so with respect to playing God, one of my favorite starting points in the world of fiction is this film, which eventually produced a book out of it, Forbidden Planet. Um, and I think it's interesting because of what the, the progenitor of the film foresaw and imagined. And I'm going to talk about it in the context of what I say analytically are four different traps that AI leads us into. Inevitability, singularity, speed, Sorry, that last one is a mistake, but we'll come back to that. Anyway, so in Forbidden Planet, the Earth explorers go off in search of a lost um, prior group of explorers. Uh, and when they get to that Forbidden Planet, they find that uh, there are only two people left from that original mission, a scientist and his daughter. And they find that there are these structures which are much more sophisticated than anything known on Earth, but they have funny-shaped doors. Um, so that's an image of one of those. And then they start talking about the fact of how all these people got destroyed, the predecessors from this other group. Um, in 1956, this is before um, pharmaceutical drugs overtook talk therapy, and Freudianism was not yet dead. So. The explanation of what happened is rooted in Freudian psychology. And what they discover is that there was an overstepping of bounds of playing God because the Krell, this incredibly advanced race, did not recognize the status of the id. So already in the text, it says, what is the id? It's an obsolete term, I'm afraid once used to describe the elementary basis of the subconscious mi mind. And so what happened when these people developed their incredible computerized intelligence and put it all together to develop a supra intelligence was that the monsters from the id came into being. And then read the description. Like you, the Krell forgot one deadly danger, their own subconscious hate and lust for destruction, the beast, the mindless primitive. And so those mindless beasts had access to a machine that could never be shut down. The secret devil of every soul on the planet all set free at once to loot and maim and take revenge and kill. So it's not a bad you know, description of the Twitter sphere, you know, uh, and what got set loose. But we're talking about a 50-year interval, and, you know, why did people not foresee that you let everybody's mind roam free and the instincts that are set loose are not going to be only the beneficent ones? There's going to be some other things that are going on as well. Hello, Hal, do you read me? Do you read me, Hal? Affirmative, Dave. I read you. Open the pod bay doors, Hal. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. What's the problem? I think you know what the problem is just as well as I do. What are you talking about, Hal? This mission is too important for me to allow you to jeopardize it. I don't know what you're talking about, Hal. I know that you and Frank were planning to disconnect me. And I'm afraid that's something I cannot allow to happen. Where the hell did you get that idea, Hal? Dave, although you took very thorough precautions in the pod against my hearing you, I could see your lips move. Right, Hal? I'll go in through the emergency airlock. Without your space helmet, Dave, we're going to find that rather difficult. Yeah, it's a famous scene, and it's iconic of any kind of disaster of a technological sort that 
You want to study historically. There's a, the designers thought of a lot of things, but there's a key missing ingredient. You know, some things that they didn't think about, the O-ring on the challenger that they didn't realize would freeze up at temperatures that were around freezing in Florida on the day of that launch, everything else they had thought about. I mean, you know, so, so this is a fable and, you know, the, it's been written about over and over and um, Arthur C. Clarke was asked himself about, like, you know, what did he think of those predictions and he says, Nothing has happened since the making of 2001 to persuade him that his vision was fundamentally wrong. He said that every capability attributed to Howe, a system that can speak, listen, reason, criticize human art, and at one point even read lips, has been shown to be at least theoretically possible. So you don't need to wait till December 2022 and the unveiling of ChatGPT, and then everybody's sort of, hey, wow, I mean, you know, I didn't think of, I mean, you know, this is like, 25, 35, 50 years ago, people are imagining the world that we're making. So if they're imagining the world we're making, and people are imagining the dystopic consequences of the world we're making, why is it that the dystopic consequences land like they're surprises when they land? I mean, you know, that is a serious question for democracy. I mean, what is it that people are forgetting in their lust for the technological frontier when People amongst us, the artists, the novelists, you know, even the worriers about the philosophy of technology. I mean, you can go back to people like Martin Heidegger, if you want, or Jacques Ellul, who came up in conversation yesterday. I mean, so it's not, it's thinkers, it's makers, it's doers, it's artists, it's anybody who has imaginative potential has already sort of been there, done that. So why is it that when you come to governance, suddenly we forget these lessons that seem to be existing perfectly happily on the side. All right, so turning to inevitability, um, you know, this is what people in the computer science, electrical engineering and so forth fields always tell us. Things have improved because there's a miniaturization, the power has increased, I don't know how often I've heard that this little gadget in your pocket has more computing power than the first you know, room size computers that were ever built. And that in and of itself is taken as a good thing because you know, how could it not be a good thing? And it moves over into you know, other imaginations. Uh, so, if the machine is evolving, so must we be evolving. And this is as good a sort of visual reminder of that famous Darwinian evolutionary image, but now converted over into the IT era that, that you could think of. So this is how people are thinking that, you know, you stand tall and you're able to walk better um, because of these gadgets. And I read a harrowing story just a couple of days ago about a woman who accidentally fell, uh, a very athletic, accomplished, beautiful woman, fell on a subway track, lost her arm and half of a leg. And what the story was about was about the prosthetic arm. And of course, it's an engineering marvel, but at least if you're my generation, you think of Luke being fitted out with his hand, but you also think of the moment when this woman is lying on the subway track. I'm sorry, I cannot get the one picture out of my head with the other picture, and they're like side by side. I mean, so do we need to inflict destruction before we cure destruction, or are we marveling at the cure without thinking about the thing that it's trying to remedy? I and mean, that is, do we have to break before we restore? And if not, then, you know, where are the where is the advance? Um, all right, so what's wrong with the picture of progress? And I won't bother going into these things in detail, but there is, these universalizing assumptions are there in the discourse on AI development, that there is this linear understanding of progress. Um, and, 
it erases a bunch of things. And I think that the problems for society lie more in the areas being erased than in the areas being constructed. And we can come back to talking about what one means by problem. All right, then there's this idea of the singularity, that if you just bump everything up scalarly and, you know, instead of curing things for a million people, you cure things for a billion people, that's better. Singularity University was built on that kind of presumption. Um, but singularity of what? And certainly in education, my um, distinguished colleague Howard Gardner of the Harvard Education School has made a career out of unpacking the forms of intelligence. But when you talk about artificial intelligence, it suddenly all gets gone together. It's like one intelligence. And you know what about these multiple intelligences? And, and to, I don't need to say this to educators, but it's not like it's sitting in this neat colored diagram where everything is a triangle in and of itself. I mean, it's known that, for instance, musical and mathematical often have a correlation and you know interpersonal and linguistic may have certain correlations that uh, you know I know lots of people who have zero spatial understanding of the world but are perfectly good at doing mathematics um, so you know it's it's not like you're everywhere at the same time and your mind is divided up into these neat co-equal triangles. There's a mixing and matching, and that happens in the biological realm in various complicated ways that we have no way of understanding at the moment. And then, not least, there are economic interests involved in fostering certain lines of research and promoting certain kinds of things. So Jack Dorsey's first ever tweet, I mean, you know, would you pay for it? What makes it worth to 2.9 million, I and mean, that is, where is this price even coming from, and what is the world that has priced it out? Now, economists like to think that the market is a perfect democracy because people's preferences guide the market, but if anybody studied the economy, economics of art, you know that there's a lot of mediation involved, and, you know, or the eco economics of book selling, for instance. So, you know, it's, where is the money in the story of perfect democracy and perfect access? It's a, it's a question. A number of years ago, I wrote this book called The Ethics of Invention, and I wanted to point out that the ethical impulse or the ethical questions often arise very far upstream at the moments of invention. Uh, and if one transposes that into the technological domain of IT and AI, one sees that how intelligence gets commodified into AI and then put out in the world at large has a number of problems attached to it. So I, of course, come from a culture that has made a religion of the standardized test, although there are you know, things that always go on. Um, a colleague of mine who teaches at Michigan, a historian, uh, looked at the history of the Stanford Binet test, and the Binet in question came from France, but France never adopted standardized testing. And he made the argument in his book about the subject, the comparative book, that the French care more about a thing they call merit, whereas we care more about a thing that we call intelligence. Be that as it may, um, the ways in which we go about measuring it are different. And the French send their children to elite schools, but at a different point in the educational system. And mathematics has a different place in the educational system in France, and so on. Whereas we needed standardization for other purposes, and one of the most compelling pieces of his writing is to show that the standardized testing in America got a huge leg up because of the army's need to pick people for the armed services, regardless of what high schools they had come out of in America, recognizing that there are immense socioeconomic disparities across America in the nature of basic education. So it was like the standardized test became a filter later on for picking out people to defend the country, and it was a very different sort of political economy. 
I don't need to talk to this group about algorithmic biases in general, but you know, one of the most interesting recent, very recent examples, long after people have started talking about biased algorithms, is what happened with the A-level exams in, you know, the, the school leaving certificate exams in the UK during COVID. So they abandoned standardized testing because they didn't want to take the risk of putting people even socially distanced into the same testing place, but they recognized that they would need to do some kind of correction because of grade inflation. So they wanted to know how to compare. I mean, this fiasco has become enough of a story that it's actually in Wikipedia, and this is a little thumbnail description of it out of Wikipedia. But they use certain factors to correct for grade inflation. And what happened to, with those factors was it systematically gave an upward bump to already privileged private school students and relatively demoted public school students. So one of the factors they used was that they bumped up grades if they were given in smaller classrooms, evidently without noting that smaller classrooms had to do with richer schools, had to do with you know, a different socioeconomic stratum. And this became so controversial that they had to withdraw the whole thing. Uh, but, the, but the things that strike me about it are, this is happening in real time in a public discourse where algorithmic bias is already a term and everybody knows it. And, you know, the sort of stratification of school systems is already known and everybody knows it. Uh, so how in uh, an aware society that invented Alan Turing, I mean, you know, how do we still have these kinds of biases replicating themselves in real time in the here and now? And so, you know, that does raise questions about the who governs. And, you know, I, I don't, we can come back because we don't have time to dwell on some of the answers that people have given. But a term of art that has taken hold is responsible research and innovation. So it's become its own abbreviation. You talk to this community and they say RRI is the answer. So, you know, it's a thing that we might want to raise in discussion. All right, then another trap that everything will be better because it'll be faster. And recently um, I had, uh, I wasn't meaning for this to be a kind of piece of abstract art, but because I was a little bit away on a balcony and because Eric Schmidt somehow is very ruddy, and because he was wearing bright red socks, this came out like a painting. Um, but it, it's the real Eric Schmidt. I heard him say these things um, at Harvard not so long ago, October of 2023. So looking to the toward the future, Schmidt predicted, everyone will have an AI assistant in three to five years. And he added that productivity will double with the assistance. So this is the speed. In three to five years, productivity will double. I mean, that's a pretty big indicator of speed. Um, and this is quoted out of our um, student newspaper, The Crimson. But first of all, does one want quickness? And of course, there is this very famous fable of the tortoise and the hare. Um, so rapidity is associated with all of these kinds of things. Uh, if you followed the news of the latest spelling bee, there was a, a spell off in which two the two left standing at the end were given a list of words and they had to run through in a fixed amount of time spelling how many of them they got correctly. And the winner, a 12 year old, Somehow they're all South Asians. I mean, so this kid from a South Asian Texan, and apparently Texas really governs this this area as well. It's about 29 words in the however many seconds they were given. So, you know, and debate winning. Um, a couple of people have followed the uh, history of um, policy debating as a an educational training skill in America. And the speed with which policy debate winners actually utter 
sentences and words has increased by some measure, measurable 30 to 50 percent over the last you know, 20 years or whatever. So speed has been valorized as a thing that's you know, good in and of itself. Well, I mean, if those are values, of course, a computer does those things faster than any of us would, so then it's valorized. But what about the other side? Uh, what about not IQ, but judgment? What about wisdom, not calculation? What about experience and not issue spotting? And what about tacit knowledge and not the ability to spout off spellings of words? And, you know, that is the tortoise side of the story. So what are you speeding up? I mean, are you speeding up? I mean, Eric Schmidt's idea of productivity, what exactly is he imagining will be produced at a high enough level? In my other work, which is on biotech, we often use a chart like this to talk about whether democratic deliberation is taking place at the frontiers of biotechnology. And the very first thing we ask is, is the way in which the question is being posed itself generating, you know, um, constraints on the nature of the deliberative process. Where are the questions coming from, not where are the answers coming from? So are there alternatives to the questions that are being posed? And then what does, what's systematically not asked? So if you look at risk assessments, people often talk about the probability of harm and the magnitude of harm. But until fairly recently in American environmental policy, they were not asking the question of who is the harm to. It took a separate social movement, the environmental justice movement, to alert the Environmental Protection Agency 25 years into its existence to the fact that it's not just an aggregate risk that we might be wanting to look at, but systematically and systemically are some people being put more at risk than others. So these are very slow learning curves that, you know, matter to the way in which deliberative democracy might work. And then this last one, which to me is somehow the most provocative, the dispersal trap. And here I'm referring to the fact that we now exist in multiple versions. So of course, we're familiar with the phenotypic version of the self, which is the version we have sitting around. But most of us by now have a biological chart of ourselves somewhere, there's DNA, things that have been done. There's a big increase in, in um, neonatal testing and ge genetic records being produced. And increasingly also, of course, we have our digital selves. So you might think of the classic traditional picture of the human in its binary gendered form in a classical work by an artist like Cranach. And next to that, the human of the DNA age, and then also the human of the digital age. And it's not that it's one or the other, it's that these are overlaid on each other in interesting and problematic ways. So when I think about that, um, my mind is led back to the fact that sacrality, even for the secular world, is tied up with ideas of the body and the respect that the body deserves. And this is Shakespeare's tomb uh, on which there are these, uh, in Stratford, there are these very famous words. Um, Good friend, for Jesus' sake, forbear to dig the dust and close it here. Blessed be the man that spares these stones and cursed be he that moves my bones. So, you know, of course, it's famous because it's Shakespeare and all of that, but, the, but it's it also expresses something. It expresses something about our feelings that there is something to the body that is different from just ordinary dust and that people used to think that there was, no matter what the funeral rituals are, so even in a cremation religion like Hinduism, something happens to those remains that they should be taken to the Ganges or should be taken to some religious point of significance and they're made part of the earth. It's not just to be left, you know, unattended to. So the genetically distributed body leaves us with the question, well, so where is it? And there are all these different places where it is. And it has very different 
shapes, sizes, connotations, meanings, implications, all of which relate to this point about ontological surgery that I made before. So physically, where is the body? Is it in a cell line that's derived from your body, or is it somewhere else? Is it in a gene, or is it in the patent accorded to the gene? Spatially, where is it? Is it in a lab? Um, molecular biology, biological engineering people often talk about a disease in a dish. Um, I was talking a couple of years ago, or a year ago, to a scientist with a child who has a, a, a pre pretty severe case of autism. And he said he had created a brain organoid of his son's brain in order to study the disease in a dish. And it was really poignant, because on the one hand, he's describing his experience as a father. And on the other hand, he's talking about the scientist. But, but it was you know, one of these moments where the thing in the dish and the thing and the person in the room who's needing 24-7 care and attention, they were sort of merging in metaphysically really weird ways. And, you know, it's, it makes one think about our imagination of the human and how it's being transformed. And then, of course, the temporal significance, which has become even more uh, a problem in the digital age. So we have these extensions of life and they're a place where moral thought can enter in because we've legalized some of these extensions. You know, we take our money and treat it as if it has a life independent of us and we can decree for generations into the future, you know, through a trust what should happen. Databases, they have a life that's much different from the life of the people from whom the data have been extracted. Biobanks similarly for biological materials, and of course transhumanism now is an entire social movement that is saying, what about extending life beyond its normal um, barriers? And periodically people get very upset about these things, and there are these things that sociologists call moral panics. And one of those arose around this very famous lawsuit against Google, which gave birth to the idea of the right to be forgotten. Since I do comparative work, I was really struck by quotations from these two uh, specialists in, in AI and digital democracy. One, both of them have been colleagues of mine, but one is in Oxford and the other is at Harvard Law School. And they wrote roughly at the same time that this Google case, the Spanish case against Google was being decided. And one of them is speaking in sort of Kantian terms, Victor Meyer Schoenberger, if you're always tied to the past, it's difficult to go, grow and to change. I mean, so for an education audience, this is something that is worth reflecting on. Whereas for Jonathan Zittrain, um, how an individual's reputation is protected, a very different idea of privacy as a commodity that needs to be protected. And then that you should leave that to the companies because they really understand. I mean, so it's the, the judicial idea, legislation by a high court is institutionally mismatched. And so you might ask, well, what would a good match be? And so the American way is take the phenomenon make it natural, turn it into a market, ideally privatize it, and then collectivize it into a good for society, but only when it has passed through the filter of being turned into a private commodity in the first place. Whereas, again, the comparative analysis is interesting that the term data subject as an ontological term, a term describing a kind of being, comes into being in European legislative discussions and not our own. In America, everybody talks, in the US America, everybody talks about privacy all the time. But that assumes we know who the subject is. But in the European discourse, the data subject was made into a thing of its own needing protection. And as I say, this all came to a head in this particular story of this rather befuddled looking man, Mar Marion Coseja Gonzalez, who had gone into debt once because of some fleeting marital problems. But then he found that every time anybody searched for his name, this indebtedness story was the one that popped up right away. And he thought this was a bad thing, and he took it to the 
European Court of Justice, and he won uh, on the theory that information that having all regard to all of the circumstances is inadequate, irrelevant, no longer relevant or excessive, does not belong on the internet. So this is what the crux of the right to be forgotten is, that there should not be this temporal gap between who we are sitting here and our expectations of how we can prolong our lives and this corporate entity, the data subject that is outside of our control, largely outside of our control, that can live forever and you know, appear in our lives to embarrass us in different ways. But we have created the prerequisites of a society where the presumption is not the moment you give over your data that will be erased. For instance, when I go through the facial scanners in my home airport, Logan Airport, it says as soon as my passport is verified, the facial detection will disappear. Of course, I being me don't really believe it, but at least in theory that is the system. And maybe if you had infinite resources, you could sue the federal government if you discovered that they are actually holding on to it. And if you had a court that functioned, maybe you could get a judicial decision that yes, they shouldn't be doing it. Anyway, these are all big ifs. Um, all right, so coming back to democracy, all of this stuff raises the question in one's mind, you know, who is the political subject in an age of technological convergence where the biological, the informational, and you know, processing capability are all converging. And you know, one should question the discourses in which people are talking about these things. So what is so urgent? I mean, what is this thing called productivity that we have to double in the next five years? And for what purpose? So that the US can win an imagined race with China? Over what? Uh, China's degree of surveillance being imported into the US and becoming the US degree of surveillance? And, and you know, for what purpose in the end? Um, People, even in the sciences, are using terms like slow science and responsible technology to fight back, to say no, urgency is not the only thing. What about deliberation being inclusive? I mean, you know, when you drive up to the School of Education, you see the indigenous center, you know, right front and center. It's a very different understanding of even how a building should fit into its environment. Um, and then objectives. I mean, are, are we even asking the right questions in a sense? So, you know, where does one go? And I've suggested one goes to art, one goes to science fiction, and one goes to all kinds of things. But if one is a humanist at heart, and, you know, I grew up in a language culture, Bengali, that uh, makes fun of itself by saying within every Bengali there's a hidden poet. My father actually wrote poetry and worked with Ramadranath Tagore, who was the great poet of Bengal at the, you know, approximately this time in the preceding century. But again, roughly a hundred years old, and I think that we can take the thing away from war and reread futility in the light of. AI and humanism? Was it for this the clay grew tall, or what made fatuous sunbeams toil to break Earth's sleep at all? So before we get into questions, um, I'm inviting Immaculate to come forward. She's prepared a response to the presentation that we just saw, just to add a little bit more juice to the experience and some more things for us to think about. So Immaculate. Thank you so much, Mike. Um, this is an incredible opportunity um, for me to have met Sheila yesterday, to listen to her speak about such an important and urgent topic of our times and that cuts across sectors, AI and democracy. So thank you so much, Sheila, um, for speaking this afternoon. I am going to follow your keynote address with a brief discussion. So unlike other topics, this topic you've presented about um, 
is so much about us humans, about our ontology, about um, what we should defend um, as humans, about the boundaries and connections with those entities and products, the materials, the machines, and the technologies which we humans um, have presented. Now, I won't repeat much of what you've said, but I'll highlight some ideas that I found intriguing. And um, I do have questions um, and wonderings too, so I'll present those. So to begin with, and um, I have more slides than probably I need to be showing, but I will do show some. Um, you spoke about the promise. Um, and you began off with a pessimistic understandings by many um, and I use many here to imply that not only the skeptics but also some of the people um, that have been the producers of technology and you did show us about um, what should we worry about um, I did really um, like the slide there w where you really went into who rules and that touches democracy um, behavior impacts on the youth, on the teenagers, and who are the ruled? The majority, perhaps the 99%, and also you went further into looking at um, the economics of these intelligences. And then touching on democracy again, you went to the constitutional issues, and it's the ontolo ontological surgery, um, that classification that comes with that, that was, um, for me, uh, um, touching the humanity, that we humans who have created um, these machines and raising a question, what does it mean to be human? What does it be mean anymore to be classified um, as human? And then you went on to look at, um, speak about the traps. So I did bring um, with me quite an old book. I didn't have to do any printing in waste paper. It's, um, it's not one that I bought. It's a 1980 book by Seema Papat. And he talks about artificial intelligence in there, 1980. He defines artificial intelligence, and he talks about good and not good um, definitions of art artificial intelligence. So then you make a connection in terms of why the panic now? Um, when this was foreseen by scholars, um, by fiction in movies, that humans were creating machines um, that we are going to be intelligent. So Seema Papa does define intelligence as that what the machine does, and this is almost 50 years ago, that if a human did it, it would be considered intelligent. That's one of his definitions in there. Now you go on to talk about the traps, um, and the speed trap is one that I found, that's where I find many of us educators. Um, thinking. So many of us educators um, want to slow it down. <laughs> like this came so fast. Probably last year was the rollout and on many fronts. So while in higher education we're thinking about CHAP GPT, the youth, the teenagers, on their cell phone they could have on an app a character, a friend who is an AI that they go to and have conversations and ask questions. So that speed trap, who puts on the brakes? Um, and for who? For the ruled or for the one percent um, that is ruling? Now you also spoke about the puzzle and the recurring concerns and the loss of control um, that we are feeling, educators, um, professionals. Now yet this has been around for a long while. So then um, AI is inviting us to ask what it means to be human and also to reflect on the political economies of intelligence, especially as seen in their impact on access and freedom of expression. So again, you touched a, a bit about that when you spoke about who is ruled, especially those who use social, social media um, and how they're ruled and the impacts on them. Um, and so it makes us ask when we talk now about freedom freedom to act in democracies, freedom of expression. Um, is it actually freedom? Is everything accessible when the algorithms are AI? And this is not hidden. 
um, algorithms are AI and they iterate and um, they do produce um, who has access and um, who has the freedom of expression. So it's not for all. It's really controlled by um, those algorithms. Now you went on to speak about um, the body, which I found um, the sacred, the human, the memory, and what AI does to that in ways that are enhancing. So technologies are meant to be enhancing. So if our memories are put together, collective enhancement, the databases, we've been looking at those things as things to celebrate. But what is sacred? What should be sacred? What should be protected? Um, perhaps what's good um, or wh what would benefit from not being in the realm of that which is downloaded to AI. And so um, there's some more of panics, I think, that are really um, well, that should, we, should, we should panic in a way if we are touching the sacred. If we are touching the sacred and some of the sacred could be the culture. So I won't go more into the synopsis. Um, I would skip over and um, really touch on where you spoke about um, the intelligences and did quote the work in education of Howard Gardner. Um, and then that causes, prompts us to think about what are the issues? What are the issues in our professions? What are the issues in what we do? And of course, the issues, um, ethics, and you did speak about transparency, the issue of transparency in technology, and what are the impacts of AI um, intel intelligence. Now, in terms of speed, um, that's where you tied in human control, like the deliberate um, control, um, and some of the inclusivity and boundaries. And I find that that's really important in light of DEI or EDI, decolonization, um, as well as indigeneity, um, where should we be putting the control? Where is slow science and where should slow science and the work of the profession and the work of the human um, be celebrated? Again, those boundaries. So the ideas that you s did speak about before I really ask what I feel is debatable and my questions here, the ideas resonate with the work in teaching in research, in leadership, in the academy, um, and also in life, and um, general learning in life. So you, um, the use of AI in higher education, um, as we are located in higher education, is a big topic. Um, but that topic I won't speak in, about in my discussion, because that's the topic of our keynote address to tomorrow. AI and education. So for my discussion, I will focus mainly on the young learners. Now, moral panic about AI tools, as tools to think with, has happened by both proponents and opponents of inventing and using AI, and I think it's rightly so. Um, and I, I think that's what your topic was about, that we are panicking a little too late, but rightly so. Um, especially in light of democracy, lightly, uh, rightly so that we panic. So I research, in my research, I do touch the material and the tools to think with, um, to use in learning and teaching and in curriculum. And so one would say, okay, you are integrating technology in learning, you shouldn't be panicking, you should be celebrating AI and introducing it in education full, spring, full, full speed but from your talk, we, are, um, we hear that full speed for what? Um, humans, full speed for what? Um, we are inventing something smarter um, than humans. We are introducing something smarter than humans um, in education. So as part of the answer and part of the job in education for me and my research team, some of whom are here and collaborators, is to help younger learners to become aware of the issues, consequences, and implications of AI. And another part that we do, which we feel is also necessary, is to help demystify AI. So students understand how AI does work. So we do this through the work of computational participation. 
Um, and we draw from the work of Yasma in Kafai, and Yasma in Kafai herself draws from the work of Seema Papat um, in 1980, when people were celebrating computers um, and apps on computers. We never used to call, call them apps th then, but utility um, tools on apps. They were celebrating to put them in the hands of learners, let's say to design PowerPoints. Um, to type text, and now was being celebrated. Now, um, Seema Papat was one of the people who said, you know what, it's a tool to think with. It's a tool of intelligence. It's a tool for them not to be consumers. And uh, in your presentation, you spoke about that positioning, that positioning of, um, of the majority. So it's a tool to think with. It's a tool that doesn't have to be a black box. It's a tool that has to be demystified. So Papa does draw from that to talk about computational participation, that we don't have to use it, the learners don't have to use it as only users, but it can help them participate. It can p help, part help them participate in the moment and now. To do what? To solve problems, to design systems, to understand human behavior in the context of computing. And so what? How do we do that in class? What does it look like? What might those experiences of computational participation look like for children learning curriculums, um, learning curriculum? And so we do l assess the effect of CP on how learners understand curricula, whether in real um, life or in curricular context or in elsewhere. And we see how they participate in making um, with all of their worlds. So AI, even when we are in a moral panic, can be used to um, help students think about those ideas that we are grappling with today, ideas of transparency, ideas of um, ethics, ideas of impact, um, ideas of where sh do we need control, where should, what should be controlled, what should we wa be worried about, what are the issues um, that we should be worried about. So then computational participation is the idea of learning by acting, by participating in their world. And some people have taken it on to say it's by making their worlds and not letting um, those machines and the gadgets that they use um, make it for them. So of note here is that democracy, democracy is at the heart. No, democracy at its heart is about the right and the freedom to participate, to access, to act, and to have impact. Again, impact outside the impact generated by um, the algorithms, but impact um, in the real, real world. So Kafai herself then is really looking at how do we democratize these intelligences? How do we democratize these computational literacies? And um, that's the work of Decesa, including AI. Um, how do we engage the students in making with, um, with these tools? So we, in this particular project that I'm drawing examples, from, it's in school and out of school, it's with communities and in teacher education, and in between there, um, I've mentioned our supporters, partners, and, and our funders. So democracy then may be seen as a choice and the right of freedom to participate, rather than a coercion to participate or an, ex an exclusion. And, and so in classrooms, what do we do um, with kids? Like how do we translate that, this to children? So um, in modeling our experiences for computation, um, they're exploring um, in designing, coding, STEM, STEAM, and of course, recently AI. And we're really um, speaking about the concepts, methods, and tools, and trying to bring them to them in, in learning context. And so what do students end up doing? They end up um, of course, thinking, creating. These are tools of intelligences, um, and they end up um, doing more. But what's important here that AI has added for us, because with AI, the students don't just need to do like they would with coding. They need to think about the broader issues um, in real life. So then they have to discuss and collaborate. And what has helped us um, do that is when they're thinking in context of like story, um, storytelling projects um, and real life and they're designing and I'm going to be able to show you a few examples um, in images. So these are children coding and playing um, image recognition in a program that they would have already used in Scratch which is um, 
used in curriculum in Ontario. Um, and they are playing um, these games, but they've also coded them. So it's no longer a matter of playing. They have to participate. They've coded them. They are designing them. And in this case, um, they're playing um, rock, paper, scissor, where I, the computer can recognize the hand gestures, and they've had to code that in. Another example is the robots themselves, and they would have done the robots and the materials. But here they begin with prototyping a robot. So what they, there's a problem. They would think a robot would, a technology will help them solve it, or an AI technology. So then they prototype it, design it. I'm using design technology. Sometimes they assemble robots. And then they imagine a scenario. So they, they would imagine a scenario, a future scenario, where that robot or AI would be helpful. But then we are prompting them to think about the setting. What might be the setting? Who might be the characters? Who might be the story, the benefits, and the issues? And I think the issues is where that's important. So they think about the issues. So you have them beginning of saying, but we need an, um, an AI will help with tasks at home. We need an AI who will um, help with the environment. We need an AI for emergency purposes. But when they begin to design an environment, put that AI in, sometimes simulate it in a scenery on screen or on a digital tangible on augmented reality, they're beginning really to think about the issues. What might go wrong with this guy that would have created? Um, what if it doesn't work? What if it ends up doing something different? And I think that's where the democracies, we are beginning to say kids can also think about the issues. Things kids can grapple around, along with us. And kids are no longer not to be excluded. Um, kids now are already included by default because they're already um, users. They're already using these tools of intelligence. So CP, computational participation, is a democratic initiative in itself, and that comes across when we begin to grapple with questions of AI. So these ideas that I've shared here, of course, are applicable in the Ontario context. Um, but they make me wonder. And the ideas, many of the ideas you've shared, um, intriguing as they are, they're applicable in the North American context. It does make me wonder um, about other contexts, non-North American contexts. And you gave an example there of a person in Europe who challenged Google um, about what had remained on the internet. So I wonder how they are applicable in informal contexts where different intelligences are valued. And so your work on showing us intelligences was helpful in cultural contexts, in non-traditional um, context, in context of groups of people and regions on the margins of advancement and commercialization of technology. The people were not beneficiaries of the economies of technology. Um, how are these ideas that are um, part of your talk um, applicable in those contexts? So in ending, I acknowledge that these are still small steps in projects in classrooms by us and uh, by other um, people who are attending today would do similar projects of using tools of intelligence and questioning them and grappling with them with kids, with students. These are really very um, initial steps, small steps. While AI is taking very large leaps and speedy steps at the moment, um, everyone is going full speed. And here you did introduce the idea of um, determinism and also some other traps that we have to be careful about. Now, the hope for us is that learners are quick to notice. Learners, once engaged, are quick to reflect on such, um, such ideas, and they do notice um, things such as, um, although not so much as the sacred, but the differences between the material and what should be sacred um, as human. So exploring the possibilities of AI and indigenous knowledge systems um, is one of those um, topics um, where you wonder. Um, how is AI related and how is these ideas, are they related? Now that topic in particular is a keynote address for tomorrow in the afternoon. Um, and um, I won't touch on that in terms of um, reflecting on that. Um, so the challenge is immense, as you've shown us, Sheila. Um, and I end my discussion of your work um, with um, two other scholars. Um, so one of them, um, actually two other 
thinkers, I'm rather than referring to them as scholars. One of them is Astra Taylor. She writes in her book, democracy may not exist, but we'll miss it when it's gone. <laughs> so I think rather than de debating degrees of de democracy, um, rather than de debating where democracy exists or doesn't exist, AI has brought us full circle, and your talk has shown us this very well, that rather than debate democracy, it can be a threat. Um, and should we defend it? Um, is it worth defending? And at this book in particular, and your talk today, Sheila, um, showed us that, yeah, democracy is worth def defending, at least from the machines um, we humans have created. Now, another um, thinker is Steve A. W. O. King, um, and he mentioned two things he didn't want to imagine knowing. Now, one of them I haven't mentioned here, but the other one is um, creating machines that are smarter than us. He didn't want to imagine that that will ever happen, creating uh, machines that are smarter than us. And that's where we are and um, makes me wonder about what in other contexts um, they might wonder about in, in AI and intelligence. Um, let's say in contexts where the democracies are, are, are being threatened, what do they wonder about this AI um, AI and its economies? What do they want about AI and its trap? What do they want about AI and its impact? What do they want about AI and um, its implication? And maybe they're wondering if they could, too could get caught up on the economies of artificial intelligence, but perhaps not. So that's where I end my discussion, Sheila. Um, and I know we will proceed on to the um, question and answer session, um, but it's been a great opportunity to um, listen and hear you speak today and also to be able to um, do react um, and discuss what you've spoken about. So thank you so much and thank you everyone. Um, we'll proceed to the next session. Thank you. But yes, does anybody from the audience have questions? I've got some from the remote audience and I've got some myself that I can ask too. But Let's start with you. Um, questions for Sheila, please. Yes. Um, I'm from an organization called iThink. Um, but the, the, the question was around children and children's acceptance of surveillance and surveillance technologies in AI. And how they perhaps seem to be more accepting of those things than we might think, and how Sheila would respond to that. Hopefully I caught that okay. Yeah, yeah. Perfect, great, okay. You know, it's, it's often interesting to get people to think what their mental model is for the things that they say, and what's striking about the kids that you're describing are, first of all, a, a recognition that self-control is not enough and they need some external supervision to impose things, which may be more easy to understand for the young ones, but th there does seem to be a desire for order that they are not confident that they can bring to the table themselves, and so they're imagining that this external uh, disciplining entity will tell them what the right way to behave is. And then secondly, that it seems to be being modeled on a parental model, which is with an assumption of beneficence built in, because one imagines that the parent is doing the thing that's in the child's best interests. Uh, I mean, that's interesting on multiple levels, because the age group you're describing are the, is the classically rebellious age where the child is testing the boundaries of uh, can I disobey my parents and you know the sort of teenage years and so on. So in a way it's interesting that the conscience when you tap into it is saying well really I know I should be listening to this parental authority. But one might then, I mean if those are the two assumptions, I need an external regulator and that regulator has my best interests at heart because it's, in effect, the parental voice. One could start problematizing that and say, supposing it's not that. I mean, supposing, and where would it click in anyway? I mean, so what are the, situationally, I mean, so 
people talked about scenario making before. Um, I think Immaculate mentioned that. So in what scenario would you imagine this external voice telling you what to do? Is it when you're part of a crowd or is it when you're you know, supposed to be doing your homework but you're secretly doing the video game instead? I mean, so it, maybe sort of getting them to unpack more what's in their minds and then that could be a basis for communal discussion and problem solving because it had become clear that um, there might be different assumptions built in. I mean, one little analogy I'll give from a completely different experience, you know, when COVID hit, universities like mine gave the kids very little notice and sent them home within five days. And it turned out that in its infinite wisdom, which was geared toward containing infection, my school, you know, considered a repository of high intelligence, had somehow forgotten that when kids were sent back home, they did not get sent back to equal positions. So they didn't remember that some kids would have better learning environments than others and gradually had to build in a bunch of exceptions. But it spoke to the fact that under crisis, people often operate with very simplified models that are not relevant to the, to the background realities that they have to deal with. So they had to carve out exceptions. I mean, the kids who could not go home because they were living in abusive family situations, or they were going back to families with multiple children who would suddenly be landed back at home, or families that didn't actually have the wherewithal to feed them because while they were at the university, they were on um, full tuition and support and hence were getting their meals for free. Eventually those exceptions were carved out, but it was interesting to me looking at it as an STS exercise, how Harvard University's public health driven mentality did not take account of the great variation in student experience that, you know, to some degree under the heading of inclusion, inclusion and, and diversity we're actually trying to compensate for. So, you know, that's a sort of object lesson in the value of bringing mental models back into the discussion and not just accepting what people say at face value without probing what is it that makes you imagine the world in this way. Um, all right, other questions? Oh, we got a couple hands. Um, in towards the back, yes. Um, no, you, yes. Yes. Okay, and I'll try and paraphrase this again. Um, I like the succinct part of the question, whereas how do we protect ourselves from ourselves? We've been talking about how do we protect ourselves from AI and from machines, but to an extent, because of the way they're put together, we're in essence having to protect ourselves from ourselves. So how do we go about doing that? Um. Thank you. I see that question in a way as a good successor to the preceding question as well, because those kids were imagining the machine as protecting themselves from themselves. But, you know, I think the history of democracy, if you stop looking at the history of technology and start looking at the history of democracy, it's full of that question being addressed and answered in all kinds of different ways, because there's nothing intrinsic to the idea of self-governance that says it has to happen in this particular way. And we've learned, for instance, through all kinds of levels of experience that just before, because you give a group a power to govern itself, it will not necessarily do it for the good. I mean, you know, people have read Lord of the Flies, and if you're in the business of educating adolescence, you've read Lord of the Flies. I mean, you know, it's um, power handed to a group does not necessarily mean a beneficent wielding of power. So we've developed all kinds of protections. I mean, so a multi-partite government, in effect, is uh, defending ourselves against ourselves, uh, constructing a barrier between the military and the civilian governance of the military is a way of protecting ourselves against ourselves, creating human rights as a domain of law and trying to understand that as transcending the laws of war, something that has been tragically on people's minds 
in the last couple of years, that is a way of protecting ourselves against ourselves. So, you know, I think that it's a very rich history and tapestry in which the production of the machine represents only one kind of expression of ourselves. It's a set of talents which admittedly are extraordinary. The, you know, the miniaturization of the computer chip is indeed a fantastic expression of human creativity. Moore's law, the fact that there has been this extraordinary ability to store things that you know, we were unable to store in such volume or process with the speeds that we can. I mean, these are not things to sneeze at. They are expressions of curiosity, of creativity, of accomplishment, and so on. But none of this is a good in itself. And for each and every one of those goods, you can posit some other set of goods that are being overlooked or put under the carpet or whatever. I mean, so I don't think that compassion is a thing that is speeded up by the computer. I mean, we don't call it, we call it a computing machine, not a compassion machine. What would it take to make a compassion machine? You know, one of the biggest reasons that people give for introducing AI into judicial decision making is the bias of the judiciary and that that needs to be overcome. So, of course, any human institution has biases, but computers have been shown to have biases as well, and they're often the biases of the hum human getting into the computer. That's why I like that British, you know, A-level algorithmic fiasco story, because highly intelligent society knows all about computers, thinks about education, a recent example, not something we did in the dim distant past when we were stupid. We're doing it now, right now, you know? And what are we perpetuating? An unequal society whose very criteria of inequality are being built into the algorithm, and then it takes some statistical demonstration that the public school kids are systematically getting rated lower than the private school kids to suddenly remind us, as, ah, yeah, like we have public and private education and, you know, the British public school, i.e. private school, is a more, you know, selective place and we're giving it an additional leg up. I mean, you know, so, so it's not like the, I mean, which aspect of ourselves have we put into the machine is, is always a real question. But which aspect of ourselves have we put into government is also a real question. And, you know, that is a thing that democracies have been dealing with for thousands of years. And, you know, I think we haven't been dealing with these machines for, for thousands of years. And, you know, my main recommendation is, you know, go easy with the hype. I mean, the hype is about a set of things, but one can be critical and yet celebratory. I mean, you know, people often want to put this as a, you know, yes or no, good or bad, you know, pessimist or optimist type of question. But I don't think it's that. It's how to make a reflective society using the things at our disposal. So I was at a meeting at Stanford where somebody said that, look, we've created these highway systems in which vehicles are whizzing by at things like 70 miles an hour, and we have, when you think about it, relatively few fatalities. And they were thinking about the automobile, and they were saying that one can imagine that with something like AI, one would create a regulatory structure that would allow the whizzing speed of computational technology to happen with as few fatalities as cars and in their multiplicity. And I was thinking, yes, fine, great example, wonderful heuristic. I'm a common law lawyer at heart, and I like good, simple examples. But First of all, what did it take to create those highway systems? They have a history. They have an infrastructural history. In the US, that infrastructure would be tied up with wartime, with making the US a more efficient place so that transport of things for purposes of war making would be facilitated. Is that coming into the equation? What about climate change? Yes, we've made LA happen, but you know, at what cost for the human climate. So how do we make society smarter in the long haul, and what are we forgetting? 
And you know, now economists have developed this term called externality. That is, but what is that? I mean, that's a nice economic term for things that we fail to foresee. And now we can, in retrospect, call it an externality and bring it into the market. But the point is there will always be externalities. As sure as the night follows the day and the day the night, think of a model, any model, and there will be stuff that's not in the model. So you can't unmake that fact. A model is always going to be some model of reality. And yet models are useful. They are expressions of ourselves. What does it take to have a capacity that is always outside the model, you know, always looking at the thing that has been left out. And I think that democracy is a struggle to maintain that kind of reflective capacity on our enormous collective power when we agree to govern ourselves, but that we sometimes wield stupidly. <laughs> and there's no singular answer other than to admit, yeah, it is a struggle. And you need an inside and an outside. And, you know, because I come from, I mean, in a sense, I'm a decolonized exemplar of a colonized culture, so I know my Shakespeare like very few of my English-speaking colleagues know. But Shakespeare always had a fool sitting next to the king. And what was the fool's role? It was in part to be that person who finds the critique of the model. Um, other questions? Yes, here in the front. Yes, you. Um, thanks so much. Um, the, it's, oh, I, yeah, okay. Come on. Yes. It's a little weird, but OK. <laughs> um, thanks so much for the, this excellent talk. And uh, um, the. I wonder if you could talk about, I, I've learned from your work to think of the kind of role of socio-technical imaginaries um, in shaping actual technologies. They're not just ways we think about technologies that kind of get inside them. And uh, can you, I think you've touched on this, but could you talk more about the specific use of generative AI for um, conversational chatbots that we're supposed to ask questions of in everyday language, which is just one. You know, if you're using generative AI to identify cancer on x-rays, that's one thing, which is, go ahead, that sounds great. But uh, um, there, most of the money and effort is going into replacing search, internet search, with these chatty things. And is, is there a kind of imaginary there, and particularly is there a, a maybe a kind of governance structure that's maybe not so democratic involved? Well, so first of all, while it is always music to a scholar's ears to have the technical terms invoked, I also typically don't use the technical terms when I'm talking to people outside the field. So sociotechnical imaginary is a big mouthful of a term but it refers to the fact that a lot of what we do as collectives in society uh, is articulate uh, an imagined sense of the collective good or put off a sense of the collective bad, and that these are not just things inside of people's heads, but that they are collectively owned up to, that people buy into. I mean, so equality, you can think of equality as an imaginary. I mean, you know, in any society, you will not find on any dimension that you care to pick equality. And nevertheless, as a sort of moral principle, people buy into the idea of equality. And where does that come from? And where is it that we learn to teach our children, you divide and the other one will choose, or whatever, I mean, as, as ways of enacting the principle of equality in some tangible sense. So people understand about imaginaries once you spell them out, and anthropologists have been talking about it for some time. What my field does, STS, is say that there's just nothing that happens in social life without a scientific and technological dimension to it. So imaginaries are every bit as much played out in the relationship that people have with technological frontiers and technological developments. And they're not just in human-to-human -human interactions. They're mediated. And, and sociotechnical imaginaries are a 
way of calling attention to that. And in turn, there's a deeper theoretical genealogy of the term. Now, the very specific thing that, that you suggest, that why is it that the interface is so rapidly changing or people put a valorized form onto the chatty version and not the internet search where the thing would appear on the screen or whatever, and is there an imaginary there? I mean, you know, I think one would have to study something like that in more ethnographic detail. I mean, I, I haven't done that, but, but I do know that it links up with other conversations that people are having. I mean, so we live in fragmented societies. Families are getting smaller, people are aging, and there's a much longer-lived, older population, and it is a strain for people in their 60s and 70s what to do with elderly parents and relatives who don't live nearby. And so the idea of humanoid companions is something that has been rising along with, you know, strange sorts of newer relationships with pets. I mean, I don't know when I first started reading about emotional support animals. I mean, one could do the Google search and find out how old that term even is. But by the time you're reading about the pro-Palestinian dissenter being kicked out of Columbia University who's regretting the fact that being on the street suddenly and being forced to look for housing and finding it difficult because there are very few landlords who will support the emotional support rabbit, you know that the emotional support animal has been built into the fabric of existence in uh, you know, really quite a thoroughgoing way. So the emotional support robot or the emotional support support AI, you know, seems to me to be part of the same nexus of things that, that you, know, you know, maybe it's the flip side of the epidemic of loneliness. And we've already had, you know, her, is that the name of the movie? I mean, you know, that the sort of fictive uh, versions of this. And, but wasn't Pygmalion a story about that as well to some extent, right? I mean, that is the, the, the dream of the perfect other who is really a projection of the self. I mean, you know, Narcissus, Pygmalion. I mean, you know, so, so we've also, also recognized there's a pathology to that. So Pygmalion is one kind of story. I mean, first of all, it was the Eve to the Adam, and there was a perfect match when the thing, uh, you know, when Galatea came to life. But with Narcissus, people regard the self-love the looking at the reflection in the in the pond and the mirror as a pathology, and we talk about narcissistic personas not as a loving and lovable thing. And so I think one can tease apart the imaginaries of the designers and what they are imagining bringing into the world, as opposed to people who invest in the thing. I mean, so are consumers being led on by a certain kind of understanding of what the object is going to be and how it's going to enter into their lives? Are they seduced by it because everybody else around it has it? I mean, I've never felt the urge to get an Apple Watch. I'm happy with my $35, I think it's risen to $50 in between, swatch that has a second hand and I'd like my analog version better than the digital version. But people love their Apple Watches. I mean, do they really, can they read the screen very well? I mean, I don't have the greatest eyesight in the world, so you know, for me that would be a pain in the neck anyway, all by itself. So, so why is it that the, the object gets fetishized and you know, gets taken up, and, and then how does it feed back to remake the imagination of what the perfect companion is. So the person in my world who has done the most work on this kind of feedback loop between the imagined benefit of the technology and the te technology's remaking of subjectivity is Sherry Turkle, whose work I'm sure is well known to many people in, the, in this audience. And to me, the important thing is not just what her findings are, but that it reinforces the, this way in which subjectivity gets built into the externalized world, which of course has its commodity fetishism and all of that behind it. And but then it comes back. And you know, I'm immaculate. I was uh, delighted that you brought 
Papert into the discussion. I mean, not only was he for a time Sherry Turkle's husband, but but quite apart from that, I have a PH, former PhD student who wrote about the educational imaginations of Papert compared with comparable figures in France and in Russia. So she wrote a very interesting study of these early pioneers of computers in education, showing that their imaginations of how the computer would liberate the psychology of learning and a child, and one of her chapters had to do with the understanding of play that each cultural person, it was Servant Schreiber in France, and I forget what the name of the Russian pioneer was, that their, their ideas of how the child would interact with the computer were driven by things in society, a sort of social compact understanding of how the individual fits into the society. So I think studies like that, which are not my original studies, speak directly to your point and show that there is a continual looping back effect in the way that the great Canadian philosopher of science, Ian Hacking, talked about, you know, looping kinds, but that these are technologically mediated, that we create the world and then the world that we've created conceptually feeds back and reshapes our understanding of the self. Okay, I, we have time for one question that I'm gonna take here from the online audience. Um, one hand maybe and there's take both. Okay, um, Lee, okay, we'll go with yours first then. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Celia. Uh, I've learned a lot from you. Uh, I'm Lily. My uh, supervisor is John Kennedy. Uh, I'm so privileged to be part of this AI team and attend this project. So my research focus is on AI education and the future studies, uh, which brings design fiction, kind of science fiction, uh, into AI education. So with that background, I'm thinking how smart people like you will foresee the impact of AI on education. For example, uh, like in a manifesto, in a cyber manifesto, uh, Donna Haraway argues that we human beings are all inherently cybers because the intervening of our bodies and identities with technology. With that in mind, uh, I'm thinking, so what do you think AI will lead education to? Uh, for example, will parents buy chips to implant to their children's brain instead of spending so much money and time uh, on so prestigious and expensive schools and universities? <laughs> so let's go a little bit wild. <laughs> Thank you. That, I mean, it's an exciting and troubling question, and the example you give is definitely of the dystopian variety, I think. Um, but, um, of course, people are implanting chips because they think it's somehow easier to go through a turnstile by putting the wrist onto the device and getting it read than by digging out an ID card and doing the same kind of thing with a swipe and you know who's who's to say what benefit people see in this but the dis a distinction between my work in STS and just about all of my great contemporaries including Haraway is that because I come from law to me the normative implications where is the reservoir of morality from which things emanate is front and center and paramount so yes uh, cyborg is a wonderful very generative idea and the cyborg manifesto is a great work in STS but is it the stopping point of discussion to say that all of us today are cyborgs in one sense or another? Or is the more interesting point that uh, things that the ethicists talk about? I mean, like, what forms of enhancement are for the good or not? I mean, so, you know, two Ishiguro novels, Never Let Me Go and Clara and the Sun, are explorations of that kind of question, like wh for whom is enhancement happening? So the first of those, Never Let Me Go, 
is a grown-up English boarding school story in which people are being cultivated for the purpose of being organ donors for other people, and when they've donated enough organs, they pass out of life. But, you know, in effect, they're utilitarian objects for the people whose lives they're enhancing. And then in Clara and the Sun, he talks about um, people being lifted, and of course, it's not with the Im implantation of a chip, but it's through genetic engineering. I mean, so he leaves his genetic engineering dystopia kind of as a background element in Clara and the Sun, but what Clara and the Sun ends up exploring is, is the relative humanism of the robot versus the human in a society in which anybody who had money got their child lifted, i.e. genetically enhanced, to be a certain kind of child, and, the, and he renders this as a very dystopic environment in which the kids cannot communicate very well with each other. And then the kid that hasn't been lifted in this sense is an outlier in that society. So all of the sort of great themes of moral philosophy are in a sense in that book. I mean, the where do we end and the where does the boundary of the non-human begin and what is compassion and what is intelligence. and you know, I was saying before that give me a model and it will have left things out about the reality of the very situation that it is dealing with. That's why it is a model and not the thing itself. So these chips are enhancing something. And I think it's up to the educators to say things as a collective about what things are being enhanced or not. I mean, you know, in general, the I would always prefer to go for the reversible therapy over the irreversible therapy, always, because I don't trust the hubris of the person dealing out the therapy. So I would prefer the thing externalized to having it embedded in me and needing surgical removal. With a pacemaker, I may be willing to put up with it, but you know, the it, it still depends on the technology in question, and you know, some enhance life and, and others don't. But even, you know, with heart valves and pacemakers, we know that the technology developed before the psychiatric understanding that if you have open heart surgery, you're going to suffer emotional and psychological consequences that are very grave for a good long time to come. So when, why that sequence, that the sort of human dimensions of living with are disco discovered later in the process than the mechanical dimensions of you know, causing to live in a physiological sense. And so I don't, I mean, it's great that we're all cyborgs, but are we better people? I mean, that's you know, a more interesting question to me. Okay. Now the online question. Um, so asked online. Uh, several school districts here in Ontario, including the largest in the province, have launched lawsuits against Meta, Snapchat, and TikTok, claiming social media products intentionally designed for compulsive use have rewired the way children think, behave, lear and learn. And educators within these boards and schools have been left to manage the follow. Um, in your experience, do you think this may be successful in forcing companies to change their policies? Or do you think the burden will be left with the school boards to adapt and come up with their own resources to respond and cope with? Again, an extremely interesting question, uh, which touches on liability law and or deals with liability law and, and you know the sort of where does responsibility lodge? I mean, if I were a school district, I'd be quite afraid because school districts typically are not well funded, and yet they're often left holding the bag for all kinds of ailments in society, but at least south of this border in America, the lawsuits are being brought against the companies as well. And there hasn't been, a, to my knowledge, yet a definitive judgment about, you know, that sets the landmark like the Google Spain case with the right to be forgotten. Um, I'm also not sure what exactly the companies are being charged with. And most of these cases are really tragic because they're being brought after a child, 
usually commit suicide and or sometimes after a murderous spree by by another child but recently as you may know in america a pair of parents have been held liable for the first time uh, for failing to guard a gun in the house against um, you know keeping it adequately from the hands of a child that then engaged in a mass shooting. I, th I think it was in Michigan, so not terribly far from here. Um, so, you know, American liability law basically tries to fix the blame onto pretty much anybody that a successful suit can be lodged against. So I would not breathe a sigh of relief if I were a school board or a school superintendent or whatever. I mean, the, a smart lawyer will always go after the entire spectrum of people who could conceivably be held liable. I'm hoping that one of these anti-company lawsuits will begin, to, or some of them will begin to set a different pattern of conduct, just as you know, the gun control lobby has got pretty much nowhere, and it's only with Sandy Hook, for instance, and a sort of subsequent uh, admittedly ingenious set of arguments about the negligence and failure of the companies, that something has begun to emerge. But going way back in liability law, there was the famous Ford Pinto case where it turned out that the Ford Motor Company had created a car with a gas tank that had been put in the back and not the front of the car and on very low impact, like five miles an hour, it would burst into flame and consume the, the passengers in the back. And after several such fatal accidents that should not have happened because the level of the impact was pretty slight, it emerged from Ford's capacious documentary record, which American law allowed to be discovered, that they had actually conducted a cost-benefit analysis and put down that it would cost them much less money to pay off the individual victims and their families than to recall all the cars. And so the price that they had set on a human life to reach this cost-benefit judgment became notorious and became a teaching tool in business schools all over North America, I think. So similar sorts of judgments can have immense impact if they're hitting the right company to the right level of anguish making um, and at the right psychological moment for people to respond. I want to thank Sheila again for her wonderful talk. Um, insightful <laughs> answers.